Hey guys, today we need to talk about how to write about references and allusions in rhetorical analysis essays. Um, I would say that the most difficult thing about writing about references and allusions is knowing enough about the reference or allusion in order to effectively write about it. If you are um, reading a a piece of text and they reference something that you know a whole lot about, then you're going to be able to pull all of that knowledge that you already have about this event or this person, and you're going to be able to apply that to your understanding of how the reference is working. If you don't know the thing that they are referencing, it is very hard to write about references. And um, even though you are going to have computers, actually, as you take the AP test and you, you'll have access to other information, it's not going to be very time efficient for you to start doing research on a reference if you don't already know what it's about. So one, it seems uh, weird to talk about this in the lecture where we're going to be um, discussing how to write about references, but one kind of general rule is if you don't know about it, don't write about it. Um, it this is not the time to kind of like dig a, do a deep dive into research, obviously, and so it won't be very effective. So if you see a reference in a text and you're like, I have no idea what that is, then skip it. Write about something else. There's all sorts of rhetoric going on in that text. Nobody says that you have to write about the references. Um, but let's say you come across a reference that you do get. You're like, oh my gosh, that's the Bible. I know the Bible. I understand this reference. Or, oh, that's a reference to the American Revolution. Then by all means, talk about references as a rhetorical strategy because they can often give the writer ethos, pathos, and logos. They can be used for logos. They can References can be used as evidence. For ethos, references can show an author's credibility. And for pathos, references can kind of tap into the feelings we have about that other thing and show that we need to have those same feelings about this particular argument. Um, one other rule that I'm going to bring up um, is don't say, and this is, this is kind of one of those phrases that we're going to say is off limits, don't say that references show that a writer knows what he or she is talking about. Um, what you need to assume is that the piece of rhetoric you are going to be reading comes from some kind of expert. At the very least, it comes from somebody much older than you. Um, and so I don't mean to be patronizing, but often people who are older have had more experience with the world. They get references a little bit more, right, just because they go through life and, and see these things around them. Um, a lot of times the references that these writers are using, it's not impressive that they know about that thing. Um, so we're going to look at an example of this. If you have not already, pause this video and read the Margaret Thatcher prompt that I put on this page. Um, and now everybody has read it, right? Okay, so as we're looking through this, Margaret Thatcher is the former Prime Minister of Great Britain. So as we are reading a bunch of her references to things like Mikhail Gorbachev and the Cold War, it is not impressive in the slightest that she knows about those things, right? Given her history, if she was the Prime Minister of Great Britain in the 80s and did not know about the Cold War, then... Um, I mean, that's, it's ridiculous, right? So for her to know what the Cold War was, that doesn't show that she has great credibility. It's just a given. Um, it, it's nothing that we should be astonished by. It's not a rhetorical strategy to say that she, like, know, it shows that she knows what she's talking about. Honestly, she gets up in front of that funeral and she says, I'm Margaret Thatcher. That's all the credibility that she needs in terms of her knowledge base about politics. So there's nothing there's nothing exciting about her knowing these details about politics, right? What she is trying to build up ethos with in this passage is her knowledge of Ronald Reagan as a person, not just as a political figure. So if you wanted to talk about ethos, you would talk about things like her calling him Ronnie and her having some inside knowledge into who he was, but not about the politics itself. I hope I'm making that very clear. Never in your rhetorical analysis say it shows that he or she knows what she's talking about. Um, that that's with big words, that's with references, that's with anything. Um, it, it needs to be, ethos needs to be a little bit more specific. Like it shows that she has a personal relationship with Ronald Reagan and therefore she is qualified to give a eulogy at his funeral, something like that. 
Okay, so then, now that I've said what you shouldn't do, here's what you should do. You should read this, and if a reference comes up that you understand, you should um, think about writing about it. Um, not as a sign that this writer knows what they're talking about, but as a way to make their arguments more persuasive. And there's two different ways to think about references. You can think about direct references where they actually say the thing, or you can think about allusions. Um, and I want to think about a direct reference first. So here at the bottom of the second paragraph, it says his policies had a freshness and optimism that one converts from every class in every nation and ultimately from the very heart of the evil empire. And there's a little footnote there so we can go down and we can look at the footnote and it says a phrase used by Reagan to describe the Soviet Union. All right, so let's say you had all the time in the world um, to research this. Or conversely, you just know a whole lot about the Cold War. You can think about when Ronald Reagan used this phrase, evil empire, for the first time. So let's look. It, it was in a speech. Um, it was 83, so before the wall fell. And he was writing about uh, the Soviet Union as the focus of evil in the modern world. So we're just going to read the little section from his speech where he actually uses the term. Yes, let us pray for the salvation of all of those who live in that totalitarian darkness. Pray they will discover the joy of knowing God. But until they do, let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man, and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. So, in your discussions of the nuclear freeze proposals, I urge you to be aware of the temptation of pride, the temptation of blithely declaring yourselves above it all and label both sides equally at fault, to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding, and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong, good and evil. Okay, so you go back to her little section here, and she is saying that his policies had a freshness and optimism that one converts, even from this the heart of the evil empire. Now, what she could have said there is even from the heart of Soviet Russia, right? She could have said even from the heart of communism. She uses the word communism earlier. There were a lot of ways to refer to that, but instead she uses this phrase evil empire, which is quite a strong phrase, isn't it? Like to call someone not just like misguided or um, uninformed, you are calling them evil. And it's not saying that the individual Russian was evil, but it is saying that this empire was evil. It's this like, it's also this biblical reference, right, to good and evil. Um, and, and you can see that in the speech that it's a biblical reference, that he's talking about like, let's hope that they come to God, but in, if they don't, then they are on the opposite side of God, which is evil. Um, and so what you look at in this whole essay or this whole eulogy, you see how she is kind of making this balancing act between the way that Ronald Reagan enforced real change against what what Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan labeled evil, um, but then at the same time how he did that with this like optimism and happiness, and she is able to encompass that in this one sentence, but only through the reference. And what happens is that she's putting more of an emphasis on the freshness and optimism and how everyone loved him, and less of an influence on the fact that part of his efficacy was in labeling um, this nation an evil empire, but that that was also important to his goals. So she like manages to say, look, he was an important political guy, and also he was just a good person, fresh and optimistic. Um, and she's able to, like, instead of weighing those equally, by just making a little reference to the evil empire there, she is saying that the freshness and optimism is more important than the evil empire. So the reference kind of happens in passing a little bit and it, it serves that purpose. Okay, so then if I were to write about the reference, that was that is what I would write about. I would not say, Margaret Thatcher shows that she knows what she's talking about because she knows that Reagan called it the evil empire. No, because they were like best buddies during the Cold War. Um, that is not impressive that she knew that. But it shows, um, if you're going to talk about credibility, it shows her credibility as a rhetorician, like rhetorician. Um, but that's not a super interesting thing to write about. Um, what this does is that it contributes to the persuasive strategies. It contributes to her argument that I just detailed. 
I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, and then the next thing that I want to look at is an illusion. Um, it's kind of an illusion, kind of a reference, but I, I think it's more of an illusion here. It's just the next little part. It says, yet his humor often had a purpose beyond humor. In the terrible hours after the attempt on his life, his easy jokes gave reassurance to an anxious world. And uh, the reason that I think that that's more of an illusion is because she doesn't name the jokes and she doesn't name the details of the assassination attempt. But what I want you to do right now is just pause this video and I put a video right below this one of like of a really great Ronald Reagan moment. Now I, uh, I, I think it's worth it. It's only 30 seconds so I really hope that you take a look at this. Um, you should know that somebody tried to kill Ronald Reagan by uh, shooting him and that he survived and then that will give you the context for that, uh, that joke. Okay, pause the video, look at that joke. And now we're back. Okay, so um, I think that this little this little illusion right here is not just to that little moment, although that moment is very famous. It's a it's an allusion to um, a whole slew of jokes that he made after this assassination attempt. Um, and I think what that little illusion does there, look where it's placed. Right after Evil Empire, she goes back to the lightheartedness and the the humor, and then she kind of she kind of obliquely references these things that people at the funeral um, are going to remember because it's a huge part of his personal character. So she makes these illusions, but she doesn't need to detail exactly what his joke was. One because it kind of ruins the joke when you detail a joke like that. Um, but also because she is sort of, she's suggesting that the real audience here is his close friends, I think. Um, so that's how a reference and an illusion can work. Um, if, if it were me, I would group those together probably in one paragraph about references and illusions, especially because they're so close together and working for the same purpose, which is maintaining this positive, lighthearted tone throughout. Um, and now what I want you to do is I want you to find another reference or illusion in this essay. And then you are going to complete the worksheet that I have attached to this assignment with that one reference or illusion, because I'm hoping that that shows you how to talk about a reference in a more substantial way.